Okay, so I think uh, we are all here and we can make a start. Today's lecture is going to be about space groups. It's a very easy subject and I hope you understand everything that I'm going to explain. Okay, so stop me if there's something you don't follow. Right, now we've done the point groups and there were seven crystal classes here and these were the 32 point group symmetries for those seven crystal classes. And one set of point groups had a center of symmetry and another set of point groups didn't have a center of symmetry. And whenever I used those point groups, uh, I only talked about elements of symmetry which do not include translation, okay? So I talked about rotation axes, but I didn't talk about the screw axes which rotate and translate at the same time. So we have 32 point groups and we have these 14 Bravais lattices. These are projections of each of the unit cell. And if we combine the 14 Bravais lattices, the 32 point group symmetries plus translations, then we get what's known as space groups. <coughs> so space groups involve very, very tiny translations. In other words, you know, a fraction of a lattice vector, like a half a lattice vector or a quarter of a lattice vector. So the effects from space groups you pick up when you look at the macroscopic shape of a crystal. Okay? So whatever translations you have, they are not apparent when you look at macroscopic shapes. But when it comes to locating atoms inside the unit cell, okay, so you have a complicated structure and you don't know exactly where the atom should go, those translations are absolutely critical to determining the crystal structure. And that is why we need to learn about space groups. So let me just remind you about what translational symmetry is about. So obviously when we move from one lattice point to another, that's translational symmetry. Yeah? Because the environment at this point is exactly the same as the environment along there. We've talked about screw axes, so here is a lattice vector. If I rotate by 180 degrees and translate by half that distance, then that's a screw dyad, okay? So you're not only rotating, but also translating along that axis. Now, this is not an axis, but it's a plane going into the board, and it's effectively a mirror plane plus a translation. So here I have a number six. If I invert it over here to get my mirror image, and then I translate by a fraction of this lattice vector. Okay, so that's called a glide plane. It involves a reflection and a translation. But of course it's a plane, right? A an axis of rotation you can only translate along the axis. But if it's a plane across which you are reflecting, then you can reflect and then translate that way and that way, okay? So there's more freedom in terms of translational symmetry. So we'll go into this in more detail. But these are basically the translational elements of symmetry. And we had our seven crystal systems, 14 Bravais lattices and 32 point groups. And then there are 230 space groups, okay? and I want you to memorize every one of them. So I'm joking, of course, yeah? You can get uh, very uh, comprehensive crystallographic tables, either on the web or in the library. There's an international union of crystallography which has accumulated all of these space groups, and I'll show you how to use them in this lecture. So it's not at all difficult, and stop me if you uh, have any questions. So notice here the emphasis on microscopic symmetry. That means the translations involved are very small and you will not pick them up if you're looking at macroscopic shapes of crystals and so forth. Okay, so these were our point group elements. The rotation axes, there's a, the bar indicates inversion and the screw axes and glide planes, and I'll explain what this terminology means very shortly. Well, it, it, it's not difficult. So two with a subscript one 
means I rotate by 180 degrees and translate by half the repeat distance along that axis, okay? Uh, that means rotate by 120 degrees and translate by half. This means I rotate by 180 degrees and translate by two-thirds, okay? So two divided by three and so on. Right, so here are the fourfold screw axes. This is a fourfold because look, if I do a 90 degree rotation, this point goes to this point here, okay? This is a fourfold axis with a translation of quarter, okay? One divided by four. So if I rotate this by 90 degrees and then I translate by a quarter of the repeat distance. So the repeat distance is from here to here. So I rotate by 90 degrees and translate by a quarter of the repeat distance. Here, obviously, it's half, two divided by four. So I rotate by 90 degrees, translate by a half. And you might be able to see a three over there. This is rotation by 90 degrees and translation by three quarters. Okay, so straightforward meaning to screw axes. And here are the corresponding ones for triad, I rotate by 120 degrees and translate by a third, or rotate and translate by uh, two thirds. And this is a hexad, and I rotate and translate, rotate through 60 degrees and translate by one sixth of the repeat distance. That's the repeat distance, and that's the translation of one sixth. Okay, I won't go into those. Right, now the glide plane. So here is a glide plane. This is a repeat distance. If I start with an object here, I reflect it onto the other side, and then I translate it by a fraction of that distance. That's the glide operation, okay? Now, there are, I explained to you that because it's a plane, uh, we need not translate along just one direction. We can translate along two directions in that plane. So, um, Diagonal glide means, uh, so, uh, f first of all, let me just go to axial glide plane, where you're only translating by one vector, okay? So half A or half B or half C, for example. Diagonal combination of translations, so one along there, uh, half along there, and half along there. And diamond glide uh, is a quarter of the repeat distance. In the case of body-centered cubic uh, unit cells, it's possible to get glide with three translations, okay? So diamond glide, basically, we will be referring to is just two translations by quarter. Okay, so the first example that I'm going to show you is about cuprite. Cuprite is a copper oxide. The white atoms here are copper, and the red atoms are oxygens. So can you tell me the chemical formula of cuprite? Hmm? Try again? Yeah, because look, uh, these are the copper atoms, uh, and there are, they are totally enclosed in the cell. So there are four in the cell. And that is the oxygen atom which is totally enclosed in the cell, but these are shared between eight cubes. So there are only two, ox uh, two um, yeah, oxygen atoms and four copper atoms, okay? So that's Cu2O. Let me just show you, um, this, this is supposed to be a movie, but it won't work. So I'll go to my, this is what the cuprite cell looks like in three dimensions, okay? Uh, just, just get a visual appearance of that because we are going to look at this in quite considerable detail. So the body diagonal is obviously the one, one, one direction and it's cubic. Okay, that will go on for quite a while. Now, uh, it's difficult, again, to visualize this in three dimensions. So what I'm going to do is draw a structure projection, right, along the z-axis. But when we have a, a complex structure like this, uh, it's good to draw four unit cells. 
projection of four unit cells so that you can see what's happening at the corners of the cell more clearly. So these are four unit cells here, the structure projections. And remember, on structure projections, we don't note zero and one heights. But when the height is not zero or one, we put down the z coordinate. So this is at a height three quarters. This is at a height quarter. This is at a height half. OK? OK. Uh, now, we said the, the formula is Cu2O. Can you tell me, by looking at one of these, or all four, what is the lattice type? So I've said it's cubic, but what kind of cubic? Is it primitive cubic? Is it body-centered cubic? Is it face-centered cubic? Sorry? You have to speak louder. You see, I'm quite old now. body-centered, okay? So let's just test that theory. So body-centered because we've got this at a half, half, half. Now, if I look at the environment around here, there are two copper atoms pointing downwards, okay? Because this is at a height half and this is at a height quarter, and two copper atoms pointing upwards. If I look at the one at zero, 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 then uh, uh, there are two pointing upwards when I look over there where these are pointing downwards. So do you want to revise your estimate? They're not, they don't have the same environment, yeah? Primitive, yeah? So this is primitive cubic. There's only uh, lattice points at the corner and a complicated motif of four copper atoms per lattice point and two oxygen atoms per lattice point. The oxygen atoms are located, in this case, at zero, zero, zero and half, 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 and the copper atoms at a quarter, 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 and so on. Okay? So the motif consists of six atoms placed at each lattice point. Okay? Can you see that there is a screw axis pointing out of the plane of the board? It's a fourfold axis involving a translation of a half. So imagine there's an axis coming out of the board. If I rotate this one by 90 degrees, I get uh, an, a copper atom at a quarter. But then I translate it along the axis by a half, and I end up with this one at three quarters. Yeah? Is everyone happy with that? Can you see that there's a fourfold screw axis? So a fourfold screw axis is labeled with four, two, two in divided by four is a translation of a half. Okay? Is everyone happy with that? So rotate by 90 degrees and translate upwards by, three uh, by half, and you end up with this point. Okay? Similarly, I mean, of course, this has to work for all the atoms. So if I take this one at zero, rotate it by 90 degrees, it comes over here, and then I translate upwards by half, and I recover this one at the body center. OK? OK, so we've identified that this is a primitive cubic cell. We've also identified one particular uh, screw axis, which involves a translation of half a repeat distance along the zero, zero, 001 direction, which is the Z direction. Right, now I'd like you to find me a glide plane. Okay. So a glide plane is a mirror plus a translation. Absolutely correct. So there you go. If I take this atom here, reflect it over here, there's nothing. But then I translate it along this direction. 
I'll end up with another at half, and then I translate it upwards. So there are two translations. Okay. One is parallel to this axis, and then one half upwards. So what kind of a glide plane is this? Diamond. Yeah, diamond glide. Uh, so diamond. Yeah. Let let me let me go back. Ah, uh, sorry, sorry. Diagonal glide. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Half, uh, half A and half uh, C. So, translating along there and then upwards. Okay. So that's a glide plane, and the symbol for a diagonal glide is N, according to the table that we had. So we're building up our space group uh, symbol. It's a primitive lattice, and we've identified one symmetry element. Uh, which uh, I includes this glide. That means a reflection plus a translation. <coughs> okay. Um, let me see. Next. Right. Are there any threefold axes? I mean, by definition, you've got to have a threefold axis if it's cubic, right? then the minimum defining symmetry of a cube is that you have four threefold axes, right? So we've got to have a threefold axis. Yeah? And that's going to be which direction? Yeah. What is the body diagonal? What are the indices? going from one corner of the cube to the opposite corner? Yeah, one, one, one. Okay. Um, so we have a threefold axis. I want to show you that you also have a center of symmetry in this crystal. And it's quite, you know, you need to stare at the diagram for a bit. But if you focus on this region here, then can you see that there is a center of symmetry here. Because look, this is at a half height. If I go through a quarter, I end up with something at zero. Okay? And you, you can do that for all of the atoms, and you will come up with the same result. So here, if I go from a quarter to uh, a height half, uh, sorry, this is the center of symmetry. If I go from a quarter to this point, I end up with another at a quarter. So there is a center of symmetry. So I can say that my threefold axis is actually a bar three axis. Okay. I can illustrate to you the center of symmetry a little bit better uh, using a, a three-dimensional diagram here. So this is the cell that I had chosen with the at the oxygen atoms, all right? But if I change the origin to be one of the copper atoms, this is exactly the same material just de redefining the origin, okay? Then you can clearly see there is a center of symmetry there, okay? So thi this is exactly the same representation as that. The lattice parameter is different, okay? But it makes it easier for you to see the center of symmetry. So we've got primitive cell, we've got n-glide, diagonal glide plane, and bar three. And of course, uh, the body diagonal is the one, one, one direction. Okay. Now, what plane? What kind of a plane is that? So it's it's a plane. Okay. Hmm? Yeah, mirror plane. Because look, everything reflects across it. Yeah. So. Here is the point groups, uh, space group symbol for cuprite. Primitive lattice, uh, along the one zero zero direction, we've got a glide plane. Along the uh, one 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 direction, we've got a bar three, and the mirror plane at a one one zero direction. Okay, so that's the space group symbol for primitive cubic. Now, supposing 
that we cannot see the translations, what would that space group symbol become? Yeah. What, what does N change to if I cannot see the translations? It's basically a mirror, yeah? So when we are looking at the macroscopic shape of cube, right, it will appear as PM bar 3M plane changes to a mirror plane, a screw axis changes to a rotation axis because we cannot see the minute translations, okay? Right, so uh, in this example, we started by knowing the crystal structure and obtaining the space group symbol, okay? Usually we are working the other way around, which is that we don't know where the atoms are located and we have 230 space groups to look at and find which is the right one, okay? So I'll go through a few more examples. Now, one thing I forgot to mention, actually very, very important in determining where atoms sit, is this is the copper atom. And if you look at its point group symmetry, that means all the symmetry elements passing through the copper atom, then there's a triad passing through it, yeah, the body diagonals, that's the threefold axis, and there's a mirror plane parallel to that threefold axis, that's the 110 plane which you identified as a mirror plane, okay? Now, if I locate a copper atom at a position where the point group symmetry is bar 3M, then it will automatically require me to have copper atoms on all of the 111 directions, right? So if I choose to put my copper atom at a location which has that particular point group symmetry, then I must have four copper atoms inside the cell. There are four of those body diagonals, right? So it is really important what is the symmetry of the site at which you put the atom because that will determine, determine how many equivalent atoms you have in the cell. If I, if I place that atom at a corner which has a different point group symmetry, number of copper atoms would be different, okay? Similarly, if we look at the, uh, these atoms here, which are the oxygen atoms, then the symmetry elements passing through them is bar 4, 3M, fourfold axis, yeah, because it, you know, this is on a cube edge, right? So there's a fourfold axis, there's uh, obviously a body diagonal going through it, so we've got the triad, and the mirror plane is the 110 plane, which you identified. And if you look at all possible equivalent sites with that symmetry, there are only two. So there will be only two oxygen atoms in this unit cell. Those, that is one and that is the other. So if you locate an atom at that point group symmetry, you will only have two atoms. If you locate it at the uh, 3M, by 3M, you will have four. Okay. So we have four copper atoms and two oxygen atoms. Now obviously this requires a lot of thinking, okay? And a lot of people have done a lot of thinking on your behalf and produced tables like this. So for every single space group, 230 of them, uh, this is really a, a very simplified table, but you can look at the point group symmetry of every location inside the cell. So obviously this is a completely general location in which there is only a one-fold axis. That means rotate by 360 degrees. So there's no significant symmetry there, okay? If I place an atom at a completely general position inside the cell with this space group, uh, the space group P, N, bar 3, M, I will have 48 atoms inside the cell, okay? And then if I place at a general position on the mirror plane so that we only have a mirror plane passing, I will have 24 atoms. But we placed at bar 3M, therefore I have four copper atoms located at these positions 
and we place the oxygen atom at bar 4, 3 M, and therefore we have oxygen atoms at 0, 0, 0, and half, half, half. So the complete calculations have been done locating all the possible point group symmetries in that space group and explaining how many atoms you should get and what the locations of those atoms will be inside the cell if you choose that as your location. So the problem is that when you do diffraction experiments and so on, there is a certain part of information which is lost, which doesn't allow you to find where the atoms are. Okay? So you can work out you know, the symmetry of the cell, the lattice parameters, and so on. But then you have to go through a trial and error process that if I place my atoms here, then what is the X-ray intensity I will get? Okay? So that's why you need to do some guesswork that if this is the space group, and if I locate the atoms here, what is the intensity I will get in my X-ray diffraction experiment? And this is why, you know, you get Nobel Prizes for solving structures of DNA and so forth, right? Because there's a lot of guesswork involved. Not completely guesswork. It's what you call educated guesswork, okay? So the real table I is far more complicated. Let me just see. Uh, well, far more detailed, not complicated. The principle is simple. Uh, so I, I don't have the full table slide with me. But it, just do a search on the web for uh, space group tables, and you find them. Okay? So all that work has already been done. OK, now let's have a look at uh, uh, the problem from a different point of view. Uh, let's say you have cesium chloride, right? It's a compound, uh, CSCl. And you've determined by X-ray diffraction that it has a primitive cubic unit cell, cubic P. Uh, we need to know how many atoms there are in the unit cell. Can you tell me how many atoms there will be in the unit cell? Sorry? Just two, right? Cesium and chlorine. OK? Um, the, we don't know what the space group is, and we don't know what the location of the atoms is. So I look up my uh, space group tables for cubic, right? It's very easy to show that it's cubic by doing an X-ray diffraction pattern, and also very easy to show that it's primitive because you will get one zero zero reflections, which you do not get if it's cubic I or cubic F. So I look up my space group tables, and I find that for a cubic system, I've got all these possibilities, all right? All these are space groups. But we know that it's primitive, so we focus attention on just the P's here, okay? Space group starting with uh, uh, primitive. And I'm going to go for this one, okay? So I'm going to guess that the space group is P M bar 3 M. So then I look up in more detail where the atoms will be located if I place the atoms at particular locations, all right? So this is the space group table, which I obtained from the International Union of Crystallography. If I place, uh, if I place my atoms at a location like this, then I will have six, six atoms, which is clearly not right. I just want two atoms, okay? So I don't have a choice. I place them at zero, 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 or at half, half, half. Okay, so I can place the cesium atom at zero, 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 chlorine atom at a half, half, half. And then what I can do is test this hypothesis by doing a diffraction experiment. Do the intensities come out correctly? Okay? Happy with that? Right. Uh, this is the diamond structure. I, I went through this in the first or second lecture, where the lattice is cubic F. Okay? And the motif is that you place a carbon atom at 0, 0, 0, and another carbon atom at a quarter, 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 because you know the carbon atoms are tetrahedrally bonded. Right? So you have a carbon atom here, and 
four atoms bonded to it, right? So it makes sense that you put one at zero, 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 and another one at a quarter, quarter, quarter. Now the space group symbol is F because it's a cubic F lattice. Now D implies that there is a glide plane, right? So can you see where there is a glide plane? Correct. So here you are. This is the glide plane. And I've got a um, focus on the atom at zero. If I reflect that, I will get it at this position. If I then translate it by a quarter this way and a quarter upwards, then I recover the atom at a quarter, quarter, quarter. Okay? So everyone happy that this is a glide plane? Yeah, these are atoms now, yeah? So, yeah. So if you recover the same atom after doing that operation, then that's correct, yeah? Okay, so everyone happy that's a glide plane? Right, now, I showed you the same structure, but with the atoms not being identical, yeah? So you remember we talked about gallium nitride or zinc sulfide? So instead of having a carbon atom at zero, 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 and a carbon atom at a quarter, 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 we can have a zinc atom at zero, 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 and a sulfur atom at a quarter, quarter, quarter. So the structure will look similar to that. But the space group will be different, okay? So remember, this is FD bar three M. We cannot have a glide plane here, because if you do the same operation, you translate a zinc atom into a sulfur position, okay? So the space group no longer has that glide plane, okay? <coughs> right, now let's do a really complicated example. This is meant to be tetragonal, the L is over there. So the space group table for this, which you see on the slide, is the complete table, okay? So this is a, a P41 primitive, and it's a tetragonal, and this, this means a screw axis. There's only one possible site where you can place atoms, which is a general position, which doesn't have any symmetry element other than a 360 degree rotation, okay? And if you place an atom at a general position, then there will be four such atoms, located at x, y, z, and then a translation by half along x, y, z, because it's a, a screw axis, quarter and three quarters, okay? So we have a screw axis here, which has a translation, and therefore we end up with four equivalent positions inside the cell, right? So on the face of it, this is a very simple space group. We can only have position where we can put uh, a, a motif, and that is a general position. That means there are no particular symmetry elements passing through it, okay? Right, so, uh, along with the space group tables, you have what's known as a space group diagram in those tables, and this is such a diagram. So, this symbol represents a screw axis. So this is a four-fold screw axis. These, these little lines here indicate rotation plus translation, okay? If it was just a rotation axis, you wouldn't have these little lines poking out, okay? And this is a, a screw diode. So if I place an atom here, then I necessarily will have an atom here, here, and here, okay? Because there are translations of a quarter, quarter, quarter. Quarter plus quarter is a half, and quarter plus quarter quarter is three quarters, right? So this diagram actually tells you that if I locate my one atom at a general position x, y, z, which doesn't have any particular symmetry except 360 degree rotation, then I will generate another four, another three, 
because of the screw axis. So for every space group, you will have a space group table. You will also have a diagram like that. Somebody has done the work for you to show what would happen if you place a motif at that location. Right, so this is uh, cesium phosphide. Okay. And this is the formula unit, just like for diamond we had, uh, you know, uh, carbon atom at zero, 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 and quarter, quarter, quarter. And the position, relative positions of those are fixed by the fact that carbon has tetrahedral bonding. In one unit of cesium phosphide, these are the coordinates of the atoms, okay? Just one unit, this is the motif that we are going to place at every lattice point of the primitive tetragonal cell, right? So now our motif consists of 10 atoms. Yeah, everyone happy so far? So let's start putting that onto our cell, which is tetragonal. So this length is the same as this. So if I place uh, an atom at this location, which is this one, then I necessarily will generate one. These are actually two here uh, at the top and bottom because the height is zero. So it's zero and one. And then we have these two. So this is, at the moment, this is just one motif and we are just plotting uh, the calcium atoms, uh, cesium atoms. So this information comes from the nature of the bonding, just like we had for carbon, uh, for diamond. Okay, so uh, if, I, if I look at it in three dimensions, this is the one at zero, zero, and one, and these are the other two cesium atoms. I'm not plotting the phosphorus atoms at the moment. Now, according to the space group diagram, if I put one motif here, I've got to put another three, right? So there will be 40 atoms in all inside the cell. Okay, so First, we've just put one motif, and then we put all the cesium atoms, so three times um, four, 12 atoms, and then we add all the phosphorus atoms. So if you didn't have your space group table, this would be really complicated because the location of the atoms is not a nice number like half, 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 yeah? So in this example, we build the structure by knowing the space group. Okay? If you've got the correct space group to start with, then your structure will be correct. And the only way to check that is you do your diffraction experiment, you measure the density of the cell. You know, If you've got X number of atoms inside the cell and you know the cell dimensions, then the density must come out correct. And various other experiments to prove that you've chosen the correct space group. Okay? So, you know, if you've absorbed all that, you've done extremely well. So, we'll stop now. Okay? Ah, one more slide. Almost forgot. Okay. It's a very, very simple assignment. All right? Uh, draw an accurate stereogram. That means you need to get the angles between the poles that you plot for a cubic stereogram. Correct, okay? So you draw a circle and then uh, draw the circle to the same dimensions as a wolf net, right? So you can download a wolf net from the web somewhere. Plenty of wolf nets available. And plot the 100 zero zero poles, then plot the 110 one zero poles, and then the 111 one one poles on it. Uh, all the poles of that form. So you already have a cubic stereogram in your lecture notes, so it should be easy to do, but just go through the exercise of plotting. And then, without measuring any angles, plot all the poles of the form 112. Okay? Straightforward. I, I will put this uh, again uh, on my website. So I haven't got copies today. <laughs> all right? <laughs> hmm. Happy with that? So it's very simple example. The first uh, 
construction you'll do with a stereogram. Just plot all the poles of the form 112 without measuring angles. So explain how you actually did it. Okay. So very simple rule that you know if you have two vectors defined, then all other vectors in that plane are a linear of those two. Okay. Okay. Thank you.